Proverbs chapter 15, we're continuing on. I guess we, we took a break from our series in Proverbs last week uh, for Memorial Day message. But uh, we'll be back. Uh, we're back in Proverbs chapter 15. Uh, principles from Proverbs 15, uh, part one. And we'll uh, try to go through a um, good chunk of this uh, chapter here in the time we have tonight. And uh, some great verses here. Uh, great verses very important verses that are so important to live by. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and for the Proverbs and, the, and just the tremendous truths of them, uh, things that we can take and just practically apply to life. And Lord, I pray you'd help us with that tonight. And uh, Lord, may you be honored and glorified through it and speak to every heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Proverbs 15, and we'll go right into verse 1. It says, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. You know, if there is one, there's a couple of really important verses in here uh, in this passage that we'll look at tonight, but if there's one that just seems to be one of the most important to live by, this is one of them. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. It is a, it is a proven Fact. I mean, just try it. You'll, you'll see what happens. You'll see what happens. If someone is already upset, if someone is already angry, and you speak softly to them, you are much more likely to see them calm down than if you respond in kind with grievous words, words that are going to stir them up to even more anger. I mean, just, just try it. And maybe you've already tried. Maybe you've already observed this. Maybe I'm not telling you anything new. But if you, if, if you have already done this, this is a reminder uh, that this is our response. The way we, we respond affects the responses of others. And uh, it, is, it is absolutely uh, it is important. Now, that doesn't mean that when a person calms down, it doesn't mean maybe the disagreement or what they're upset about is going to be resolved right away or, or whatever the situation may be. But at the very least, the outworking of that, of how upset they are, they can calm down. They're, people are more likely to calm down when spoken to softly as opposed to uh, just you know, being yelled at and, um, and being, uh, you know, if they're already angry, the worst thing to do with a person who's already angry is just to speak angrily back to them. Uh, it's just going to stir them up more, and, it's, and that's the way things, that's how things escalate. We need, to, we need to make sure we have the right responses. Uh, and what, what makes the difference? How do we have the right response? We need to be Spirit-filled. If we are led by the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, then we are going to have those right responses rather than fleshly, carnal responses. Just because someone else is, is uh, responding in a fleshly way, in a carnal way, does not give us ever any right to respond in a carnal, fleshly way back to them. So the, the you know, two wrongs don't make a right. You know, if, if, uh, you know, if Russ is angry and, uh, and I'm angry, and I'm angry too, I'm just stirring him up by grievous words in response to him. And, uh, you know, one plus one doesn't equal two in a good way. Uh, if, if you have one plus one, one angry person plus another angry person equals two angry people. Uh, it's not one minus one. One angry person my, uh, and, and then a, a, a person who's not angry, you know, then that equals, it can actually equal zero angry people when you're done with it. And uh, so one minus one equals zero. But what you want is a, not one plus one equals two angry people. You want one plus one equals zero. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess up math tonight, but, uh, but the point is one angry person plus one person giving a, a soft answer can then equal zero upset people, or at least people who are acting out or, or, or uh, saying things, yelling, carrying on, whatever, uh, whatever the case may be. And uh, y usually just, um, now there are times when, when someone is, uh, you know, of course you have to use discretion on what exactly needs to be said. We, we, need, we need discretion, we need wisdom, discernment in these areas, but our response, the principle here is our response affects the response of others and, uh, and makes a, a big, big difference. 
it can make a big difference as to what their view of us is in the future. How, how willing are they to listen to us? How willing are they to receive instruction or wisdom or, or whatever it may be? Uh, we need to have the right response. We need to be spirit-filled and, uh, and use discernment in our responses. Unfortunately, anger is, uh, can be contagious. Being upset can be contagious. And so it's just like a natural fleshly reaction then to respond in kind. So we need to deliberately, deliberately respond in a soft way. A soft answer uh, turneth away wrath. Uh, verse 2 says, The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. The wise know how to use knowledge, but fools do not. And uh, in, in other words, you know, the, a wise person, they have knowledge, but they use knowledge in the right way. Where a fool, I mean, they just spew everything out. They think they've got uh, all filled up with knowledge, but really, it's, you can just, um, you know, what's the saying? Uh, you could, it's better to have people, better to keep your mouth closed and people to think you're a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt or something yeah, like yeah. that. I don't know if it's, if it's fool or if it's another word. I'm, I'm not doing very well today with... Uh, with those sayings. I, I tried one at the nursing home and I think I butchered it, but I got the point across. Oh, it, was uh, it was good. Okay. Um, but, uh, but it's true. It, it is true that, uh, you know, the, the a wise person is not going to just say something because they know it. A wise person is going to use knowledge in the right way at the right time, whereas a fool is going, if, notice the word, two, two different words, useth, and poureth, useth and poureth. We generally at home, we do not like our children getting a hold of um, food supplies from the cupboard. Uh, I believe there was a, was, was there a spill of baking, was it baking powder or baking soda yesterday? Baking powder? Okay, there was baking powder spilled on the floor yesterday. I don't know how much it looked like. Uh, you know, there was some. Had it been cleaned up before I was told about it, before I knew about it? Was that, was that after it was cleaned up? There was still the residue all over the corner, in the corner? All right, so somebody spilled uh, baking powder, and it was being used in some way that was not for baking. There was some pretending on. There's a lot of pretending that goes on in our house. And uh, so there's some pretending going on, and somehow that resulted in baking powder being spilled or I don't know how much of it was poured, but it was not used properly just with a spoon, you know, uh, just a small spoon, just a small uh, portion that would be used for baking, whatever the recipe is. And so there's a difference between using something and then just pouring. Usually you don't pour. Uh, you, it's, it, there's, there's things that are measured. If you're baking, you're cooking, you measure things. You don't just simply pour it out uh, just uh, without really measuring what you're doing. And uh, that is the way it is with knowledge. We need to use knowledge in the right portion at the right time in the right way, and the wise person will do that, but a foolish person, their mouth, it's just going to pour out. It's going to be to excess, uh, way too much, and, and what comes out is foolishness, not actually uh, good uh, knowledge that is beneficial to people. Verse number three says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. And this is a, uh, an important verse about God's omnipresence, the fact that He is everywhere. He can see everywhere, see everything, and His omniscience, that He knows everything. And not only does God know everything, not only does He see everything, but I know, you know, notice that it's beholding the evil and the good that there is a distinction made, that there is evil and that there is good. And so God is not one who's just observing the world and observing every person in such a way that, that everything's just neutral and that there's just this monstrous gray area. No, He sees evil and He sees good. There is a distinction between the two, but He does see it all. God knows everything. And, uh, you know, that is a great understanding to have great peace of knowledge to have that we need to understand and, and use in our lives that it should affect our, our thinking, it should, affect our, our, it should affect our actions, the recognition that God is 
everywhere we were having a conversation, we've joked around sometimes that in our house or even maybe here, but in our house especially, we need to have security cameras so that we can get to the bottom of what actually happened. <laughs> because there's often you get conflicting stories and you just, you never come to the, the right answer. There's times we wish we did. Uh, but you know, um, I think it was Eliana that said uh, this morning, we were talking, we, uh, that came up here actually, and she said, you know, was it you that said this? That, uh, you know, you'd be more likely to do what's right if there was a security camera. <laughs> and by the way, security cameras do affect behavior. I mean, if you're in a place where you know there's security cameras, uh, you know, I think there's, there's an awareness there, oh, I'm on camera, I might want to be careful about what I do. So there is some truth to that, that does affect behavior, but I said, you know, I said, but God watches everything all the time. God sees everything anyway, so even if there's not a security camera, you know, God is the ultimate security camera. He's everywhere. He sees everything. And, uh, and so that's a, a great truth. Uh, you know, children need to know it, but you know, adults need to know that too. Because how many things are, are done in secret that really aren't secret? They're not done secretly in God's sight because God sees everything. They're not hidden from God. And so we need to recognize God is a God of, of knowing all, seeing all. He sees both the evil and the good. Verse 4 says, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. Now, I, I love this word wholesome. Uh, and then the connection, there's a connection with tree of life, because wholesome has to do with uh, healing, something that is um, uh, going to be nourishing. So if you have, um, you know, think of a food that you like, and uh, think of it in its purest form. Maybe think of it as organic and healthy, good for you. And you'd say, well, this is a really wholesome food, a wholesome meal. And then on the other hand, there might, be, uh, there might just be a bunch of junk food that is, you can't make the arg you can't even begin to make the argument that it's wholesome. And uh, I'm still working on that Pepsi vanilla. And uh, so I went down, <laughs> I went downstairs I uh, grabbed a couple cans because I didn't have any in the refrigerator, and I thought I want it cold after till after church to you know drink with our popcorn if we have popcorn, and um, and we have girls that uh, I mean all I got to do is just mention that and you know I get the reactions, um, but uh, anyway, you know I can't I'll be honest with you I can't even begin to make the argument that Pepsi Vanilla is wholesome. I'm not going to start making that argument. I'm not going to try to make that argument. But I will say, the popcorn we use is a non-GMO, good quality popcorn. I don't know if you could call it wholesome if it has healing properties, but I sure enjoy eating it. Um, but think about your whatever food it is. There's, there's the wholesome food, but then there would be a food that is just not good for you. It's just completely junk and uh, it has bad effects on the body. And even though I still drink soda, I try to drink it in moderation to where I'm not, because uh, I can tell if I drink too much of it, it's, it's not going to have a good effect on the immune system. It's not going to have a good effect on, on various things. And uh, I did say that if you didn't behave, you were going to not have popcorn tonight, so you better stop. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> but a wholesome tongue, so we're not talking about food, but the wholesome tongue is a tree of life. So there's the comparison, a tree of life, something that's healing. Think of something medicinal. Think of an herb. Think of, think of something that um, you have that is, is a, uh, just, just uh, there's, there are different herbs and, and things that people use as supplements or, or a, for the purpose of healing. That is, that is what a wholesome tongue is compared to. In other words, what comes out of our mouth can either help heal people, it can either be good for people, it can be nourishing, it can be refreshing, it can be encouraging, or it, uh, or it can be perverse. It can be perverse. Now, what, what, is, what the focus here is not so much the effect on other people, but what it shows about the person, him, him or herself, that what comes out of their mouth is a reflection on the root in their own heart, in their own life. That it says, is a tr the wholesome tongue is a tree of life, that it, the, the, what comes out of the mouth is a reflection of what is nourishing on the inside, that that person themselves has something nourishing and wholesome on the inside and it comes out. But a, 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 
Uh, but perverseness, something that's crooked, something that's not just straight down the line, therein is a breach in the spirit. A breach. Well, what's a breach? It means there's an opening in, 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 uh, in that person's spirit, in their, in their life. There's an opening there where just something's not right. Something's getting in. Now, be, uh, I think about a breach. You know, if there's a, uh, if there's a, uh, a dam or a levee that is breached, there's been just tremendous flooding out in the, the Midwest and in Arkansas and different places. Uh, and if, if something is breached, you know, in other words, it means... You know, the dam or the levee is holding back the water, but when there's a breach, there's an opening, and it just, it just there's things that rush through. And the same, thing takes, the same thing is true in a person's life, is that when there's a breach in the Spirit, if there's an open area that should not be open, then it allows a bunch of things that, that should not get in, and then what gets in eventually comes out, and it comes out through the mouth. You can tell a lot about a person as to the way their mouth is. You think about, the, about people in their foul language today and just the, 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 the innuendos and just the perverseness uh, of the speech of people today. That is a reflection. That's just not, oh, you know what? You need to clean up your mouth. They do, but it's a reflection of there's a breach in the spirit. If there's perverse speech going on, there's something wide open in their life that a bunch of junk, a bunch of garbage is getting in and it's manifesting itself uh, through the mouth. It means they don't have the walls built up in their uh, build up in their spirit that they are, um, uh, you know, that there, there are things guarded, that they are guarding what comes in, what goes out, and uh, there's just an opening there uh, that the enemy has, uh, the flesh and all kinds of things have uh, wide open uh, reign. So the tongue can be used uh, either for healing or for viciousness. That, I mean, it can be either be, um, it can either heal with the speech or, you know, just, just speak in a vicious, nasty way, perverse, crooked way. Now let's go to verse 5. A fool despiseth his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. A fool despiseth his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. Now we've, we've already had a message on prudence uh, a number of, well, maybe a couple months ago now, but uh, the, so we won't uh, necessarily delve in too much about this, but what is prudence? Maybe, maybe give you a reminder of what prudence is. It is not just wisdom. It's very similar to wisdom, but it is the cautious use of knowledge. So you have knowledge, which is, the, which is facts, the understanding, which is a comprehension of facts. Wisdom is then the uh, knowing how to use it, knowing how to use those facts, knowing how to proceed, and then prudence is actually proceeding, but with caution. And so he that regardeth his reproof is prudent. It means that, you know what, uh, somebody's warning me about something. I better be careful in how I proceed. If I'm going to take that warning seriously, I'll be careful in how I proceed uh, so that I do not get into trouble or do something that I should not. But it says in verse, uh, verse 5, a fool despiseth his father's instruction. So a foolish person, isn't, they're, they're not prudent. They, aren't care, they are not proceeding with caution. They don't want to hear about, they don't want to hear the instruction. So there's a contrast there between the fool and the one that is prudent. Verse 6 says, in the house of the righteous is much treasure, but in the revenues of the wicked is trouble. You know, a little bit uh, with righteousness is better than much trouble. It is better than trouble with much as a result of wickedness. A little, a little with righteousness is better than, than trouble with much as a result of wickedness. You know, the, those that are wicked, no matter what they have, no matter the amount they have, it says in the revenues of the wicked is trouble. Whatever they have materially, financially, they're, they're, still, going to, they're still going to have trouble in life. Because of their wickedness. But in the house of the righteous is much treasure. It doesn't necessarily mean that they have, that they have an overabundance, that they're always materially wealthy. But you know what? There's still treasure there. What they have is still very valuable. And it has to do with the righteous compared to the wicked. In verse 7, The lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the foolish doeth not so. And so once again, coming back to the dispersal of knowledge, 
And a wise person at times is going to disperse knowledge, knows how to use it, knows uh, what to do with it, but actually will do it. But the heart of the foolish doeth not so often because, uh, be, because they don't have knowledge to disperse. Why? Because we know what? They're, the fool despises instruction. Uh, the fool is not a teachable person. And so they, uh, if you're not teachable yourself, if you're not receiving instruction and, and, and direction and correction yourself, you're not going to have that to give to others. All you're going to have is pouring out foolishness. And so it's important to, um, to disperse knowledge. Uh, it's important to have the knowledge, but then also to disperse it at the right times. Verse 8, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Interesting, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. One example I think of is um, uh, with, uh, with Saul. And, um, you know, Saul is, he made a sacrifice, but yet he was doing wickedly because of his rejection of the word of the Lord. God had given him commands. He said, you need to do this, this, and this. And he did not obey on a couple of occasions. He did not obey. And so, and one of the times had to do with a sacrifice being made. And so he, he tried to, and he, he made the sacrifice himself. He was to wait seven days. Samuel was going to come, and, and it was the seventh day, and Saul's getting restless and impatient. They're getting ready to go to battle with the Philistines. The people were getting restless, and he's losing. He needs to do something to consolidate power. And so he goes ahead and offers the sacrifice. Well, you know, just on, right on cue, Samuel walks up, and... Saul tries to make all these excuses about why he sacrificed. You know what? It's a sacrificing to the Lord. It wasn't his place to do it. And Samuel said to obey is better than to sacrifice. And same, and same thing, I may be getting the passages mixed up on the second occasion. Uh, he was to destroy all of the Amalekites. And he said, well, you know, the people saved the best of the, the, the herds, of the, the animals for sacrifices. He says, to obey is better than to sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. And he, that's when he says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as idolatry. And, and you know, so was God impressed in the least, in the first occasion, with Saul's sacrifice? No, he wasn't. Was he in, impressed in the least uh, with, um, with Saul's saving, uh, Saul and the people, they're saving the animals, the best of the animals, when they've been told just, you need to wipe them all out, utterly destroy them. Now, there were other times when God did allow them to save the best of the animals, and they would use those for sacrifices. In this particular case, he says, look, there's, there, uh, judgment needs to be meted out upon this group of people, and they need to be all wiped out. And Saul did not follow, that, follow through. And so God was more important with Saul's obedience than with him trying to do something that looks spiritual. And you know what? There are, there are people, whether it's in churches all around or just in society, they think they're doing good for God, that they're making these sacrifices, that they're living for God. But in reality, their, their heart condition is still wicked, and those people are an abomination to God. It doesn't matter what people do in the name of God. It's still an abomination. Just because it's done in the name of God does not mean God is pleased with it. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. So what does God delight in? He delights in the prayer of the upright. And the contrast to Saul was that of David. Now, we're not going to turn here for sake of time, but if you read Psalm 51, it's interesting. That was David's prayer of confession and repentance with his, regarding his sin with Bathsheba. And uh, at the end of Psalm 51, he says, you know, basically he, he recognizes you don't desire sacrifices, else I would give the sacrifices if that's what you desired, but it's a broken and contrite heart is what you're looking for. You're not going to despise that. And so uh, David recognized that, and he was the contrast of that. When he was pointed out as the guilty party, he had a repentant heart, he confessed his sin, and God was delighting in that and listened to the prayer of him, the upright. Even though he had sinned, he was repentant, he confessed it, and he was getting it right with God. That's what God desires. God desires uprightness. God desires those that are, are wanting to do right and those that are right with God. 
rather than those that are just doing things in the name of God, but in reality they still have wicked hearts. And that is all the lost can do. All the lost can do, even no matter what they do in the name of God, they, have, they, have, they can do all they want, but there's nothing that's going to impress God in their lost condition, in their wicked condition. Uh, verse 9, the way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. So once again, a contrast here of the wicked and the upright or the righteous. And um, the way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord. Now what you see here is this contrast. You have the way of the wicked being an abomination, but then you see the word he loveth him. Now that word love there has to do with an uh, affection. And this is where some people get the whole idea of love uh, mixed up. That be, just because God loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that somehow everybody is on the same level as far as in, in God's favor, as far as who God is most affectionate toward. And that is just not true. God loved the world, so he has a universal love that, that he loves everybody. He loved everybody enough in the sense of a sacrificial way that Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for everybody's sins. In that way, God loves everybody. But you know, in a practical, everyday sense, there are people who God loves more than others. Oh boy, get in trouble for that one in a lot of places. I hope not here. I mean, God loves somebody more than... Well, yeah. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. I mean, that's, that's in the scripture. Jacob have I loved. He, what does that mean? It meant that he had a special affection for Jacob, a special plan for Jacob, who was... Uh, a partaker of the promise and the covenant. And you had Esau, who was willing to sell his birthright, and Esau, who was going his own way, he was, he was not as close to God. Esau was not as close to God. And so there, in, in that regard, God rejected Esau as far as his plan, and he loved Jacob and had affection toward Jacob. And the same thing is true today between the righteous and the wicked in their path that they're on. God has no time and no interest in the path of the wicked, the way of the wicked. He's, he, that, that is an abomination. In other words, it's repulsive to him. And that, but it says, but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. So who is God most affectionate and favorable toward? Those that follow after righteousness. So if someone wants to be close to God and experience the great favor and closeness of God, then get on the right path. Go down the path of righteousness as opposed to the path of the way of the wicked. And so that, that is not negating, as I said, the, the universal love that God has for all people, that, uh, the sacrificial type of love that, uh, uh, that, he, he, that Jesus Christ uh, came to die on the cross. But there is more of a relationship type of love that there are people who, uh, are, who experience more of that love than others. And uh, it's based on, you know, what, is my heart right with God or is it not right with God? Is a person saved or are they unsaved? Is a person going down that path of righteousness or are they going down their own path of wickedness? And uh, that makes a big difference as to God's uh, attitude toward that person. Now, we could go much more into just the subject of love uh, in the Bible, but that's just a little taste of it. Verse 10, correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. What is the way? Uh, the way is the right way. Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way. Those who get on the wrong path have a bias against correction. And that, that's the challenging part for people who are already on the wrong path. They chose to get on the wrong path. They end up there. But then when, they get, uh, when someone's there to correct them, then they have a bias against that. It's grievous. It's like they just can't stand it. It, it brings grief to them. They don't like it. They don't want to hear it. And so that's what makes it harder why people have such a hard time getting off the right path because they haven't humbled themselves enough to receive the correction and instruction. It requires humility to admit that they're wrong and to actually take the steps to go in the right path. Get off, get off the wrong path and go back to the right path. But it says, And he that hateth reproof shall die. 
And so there's a bad end that comes to those who hate reproof. They reject it. It's detestable to them. Those that try to correct them, those that try to bring reproof, those people, if they don't change their ways, if they don't change their direction, have a change of mind about some things, uh, they're, they're not going to have a good end in life. They're not going to have good results in life. The ad, a person's attitude uh, toward correction has, is one of the greatest indicators as to whether they are proud or humble. That's one of the greatest indicators of how a person receives correction. If a person does not receive correction well, uh, it's usually they, they have a, a heart of pride uh, and, and stubbornness and perhaps rebellion. Uh, it could be that uh, as we get down to verse 12, there's, there's the scorner. It could be they might be a scorner. But someone who actually receives correction, there's a, that's a display of humility. And it doesn't matter who the person is. It might not, be, might not be a person they care for that much, but they might still receive the correction well and take heed to it. And that is a show of humility. And, uh, and, and they are preserved from destruction and, and bad things that can come down the line if they heed that warning. Uh, but then verse 11 says, um, Hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? And so just briefly here on this verse, as much as God knows the dwelling place of the dead, He knows the hearts of men much more. So once again, God seeing all, God knowing all, and uh, He knows how much more than the hearts of the children of men. God knows everything about everyone's heart. No one can hide, uh, no one can hide uh, from Him and uh, conceal things in their own heart from the Lord. And we need to keep moving. Verse 12 says, A scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. Now next Sunday night, uh, the plan is to have a message on the scorner. Now the scorner, I, did, I just did a, 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 a search for scorner. I did not search for a derivative word. I will this week as I prepare for the message. But the word scorner is used 11 times in the Bible, and 10 of those times are in the book of Proverbs. So Proverbs has the most to say about a scorner uh, anywhere in the Scripture. And that will be our focus on the, this verse and other verses next Sunday night, Lord willing. A scorner loveth not one that reproveth him. In other words, a scorner does not have affection for those that try to bring correction and say, you know what, you're going the wrong way, you're doing the wrong thing, you need to get that right. No, a person who's a scorner, that's someone who's a scoffer, a mocker, someone who just has no time for the things that are right and for, uh, they, they, they hate authority, they uh, despise, um, you know, they, they certainly uh, are not humble people. And, uh, and a scorner does not love one that reproveth him. So you know, don't, don't try to get a scorner to love you. If there's someone who is a biblical scorner, um, you're, you're not going to really be able to do anything to get them to love you. They just need reproof. They just need reproof. There are people who have scorners in their family or, or friends or whoever else. And, uh, you know, and they just try to do things to get in their good graces. The scorner is all about his own way and his own desires and, and having it his way anyway. So you, you don't, there's no need to try to get a scorner to love you. Now, I'm not saying, once again, I'm, I'm not, uh, we need to be careful with what comes out of our mouths. So it's not like we're just nasty to a scorner. That's not right. But... You know what? Uh, if a scorner needs reproof, they need reproof and don't expect them to like you for it. <laughs> but we'll see what the Bible says about the scorner. There are times when a scorner needs to be reproved and there's actually times to leave the scorner alone. And we'll, we'll see that uh, next week, Lord willing. And then verse 13, A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. The condition of the heart affects the rest of one's being. You know, just whether or not a person is merry or sorrowful on the inside, that affects their countenance for good or for bad. It can affect, it can affect their body. It can affect, you know, there, there are people who they're... they're um, countenance and their body language, their expressions, you know, can just be very down and you can just tell, you know, that person's really, there's really something going on. Yeah. And then there are other people who, you know, they have a cheerful countenance. You can tell it's just a genuinely cheerful countenance. 
And that person has a merry heart. So what's in your heart will, it will come out and affect your countenance. And I would just encourage you um, that even when circumstances of life are weighing you down, that having a merry heart can still be possible. Find something to be merry about. Look to the Lord. We, we can be, at least rejoice in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord. And you know what? There are times it's okay to uh, feel the pressure and the, 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 the sting of life, that, of circumstances that come. Now, that's understandable. But there are people, they just live down. They just live with the sorrow of the heart. And what does it say? The spirit is broken. It's hard when people, when people get to a very, very low point because of what's in their heart and their spirit being broken. It's really hard to get them back up out of that pit. It's really hard. It's better just to not go there in the first place because it can take a lot to get out of that pit and it can take a long time. And so, you know what? You might not have very good uh, circumstances in life going on at a certain, at a given time, but we, if we look to the Lord and just find uh, the, the joy of the Lord is my strength, that I'm going to have joy that comes from the Lord regardless of my circumstances. I'm going to have a merry heart uh, even with these uh, challenges. But there, there are people, they just live sorrowful. They live broken. And you know what? There are times all of us experience brokenness, and that's not a sin to experience brokenness. But, uh, but when we allow our hearts to stay in that, remain in that sorrow, that can be a, a very bad thing for our bodies. It can be a bad thing for our countenance. And uh, there comes a point in time we need to... to to get up out of that and have a merry heart. That there are things to rejoice in. There's a pastor in Maine. Uh, I, I mentioned that during the prayer uh, time tonight. Uh, I got an update. I, I, I'm on uh, an email. I got an email update from him. I don't know him personally. I know of him. But um, he started a church in Maine and um, a few years ago, maybe. His wife was diagnosed with uh, just terrible tumors, cancer uh, and tumors throughout her body, not just one particular place, but I mean, just, just in various places. And it sounds like just the state she's in, it's been, been terrible. Uh, she hasn't been in church in months. He himself, I believe, has been, only been in church a couple of times to preach in the last few months because he's at home having to take care of his wife and she's gone to the hospital for treatments and, and various things. And these treatments aren't really... Um, Although I think there was some radiation that was, that was uh, working for a couple of tumors, but then the rest of them, you know, they, they weren't able to keep doing the chemo at that time or decided not to do the chemo at that time. So anyway, just the whole thing is a mess. I mean, it's just, it is such a, a terrible, terrible experience for them. But what he said, and, and, it's, and it very what much comes through the way he writes these updates, is that, I mean, it's... I think he might have even used the word nightmare, that just being honest, that it is a nightmare. And the way that he's described things, it is a nightmare. Uh, it's probably a financial nightmare. Uh, I don't know what kind of health coverage they have, but it sounds like they've, they've taken a hit financially. The, the blessing of it is, and he's, he was reporting this, that their church people have really stepped up and have just really done a tremendous job of just moving forward, even despite with basically not having their pastor there pretty much every Sunday. And, but what he said in the, uh, uh, there was an attachment with the main update about this. And then, uh, but on the, the text of the email itself, he did mention that he was not really, he really didn't want his wife seeing this particular email. And the reason being is he was telling things that were factual, but he did not want to dampen her spirits by having all these things out in front of her in that condensed form of just how bad things are. He had to be honest with these people that he's writing this letter to and, and that, that are praying for him, honest of just how bad things are, but he, he did not want her, his, his wife necessarily to be uh, seeing all of this in, in the way that he had laid it out there. Because, and she knows how bad it is, but at the same time, he wants her to be able to still be as of good of spirits as possible, even in the midst of this tremendous time. And I think that's a good, it was a really good approach, very interesting to see 
uh, that that was the way he handled it. But, uh, you know, it's still possible, even in the midst, to uh, have a heart of rejoicing. I think of another pastor whose wife passed away from ALS, a pastor in Connecticut. She passed away, I think, a couple of years ago. He's remarried now. And, um, and, uh, and, and, but yet at the same time, he kept, even, the, even through the grief and the heartache of, of what his wife went through, she, we got to see her in, in, uh, before she had passed away, not right before, but just during the time when this was taking its toll and she was confined to a, a wheelchair and losing use of, of her arms and, and gradually her hands. And the, the spirit that she had, even in the midst of that, was just, I, I don't exaggerate just how good it was, how sweet it was of this, of this testimony, this person, the testimony for the Lord, and also then her husband in facing this and having a young child who's losing his mother, who, who I believe probably, as it seems to be doing well, probably in part because of his own father's attitude and his uh, heart toward this situation. And so now he's, uh, he's remarried, and, and so his, his young boy has, a, has another mother. And so I, I think, uh, and of course, there's only so much you can see based on fa- so, uh, Facebook, social media. But the thing, just knowing him, uh, I think what comes through on, on social media is a reflection of, of his heart and the way things are going. And so there are, there are testimonies like that when you can see people even going through these terrible things, these heartbreaking things, and yet they still somehow can have a merry heart and rejoice in the Lord. Doesn't mean they don't feel the pain, doesn't mean they don't feel the, the grief and the burdens, but they don't live there, they don't stay there, they just keep their eyes on the Lord and keep on moving forward for the Lord and let, let the rest in His hands. Uh, so the condition of the heart affects the rest of one's being. In verse 14, the heart of him, two more verses, the heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge, but the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. So what, what do you seek? What do you feed on? Now an understanding person, a person with understanding seeks knowledge. Is going to cont- try to, there's always more learning to be done. Uh, the heart of understanding seeketh knowledge, but the mouth of fools, what does the mouth of fools feed on? Foolishness. Just things in life that do not matter. Things in life that have, have no value it's not going to help them. They're not going to be a help to others. And once again, the distinction between those that have understanding or those that are wise and also those uh, that are foolish. And the last verse here, number 15, All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. Kind of a, maybe going back to verse 13 and, and the, the uh, condition of the heart. He that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast that your the condition of your heart affects your outlook on life. So if a person is afflicted, in other words, afflicted in their own heart, that they just live that way, it says all the days of the afflicted are evil. There just seems to be nothing good going on. Everything's bad. Everything's a problem. There's, there's just nothing good to see. But if a person has a merry heart, you know what? There, there's a continual feast. There's a... Um, there, there can be things to rejoice in, things to celebrate. And uh, so the heart condition, having a merry heart. You know, a lot of times, the only times we use the word merry is Merry Christmas. Uh, but the Bible uses the word merry in different contexts. And, uh, you know, merry, being happy or joyful and, and uh, having a, a lightness about it. Not, that's not looking at life casually. That's not looking at life Uh, just looking at life flippantly or living life flippantly, but it is, you know what, I'm going to be merry. I'm going to be cheerful. And, you know, you can be a good example and a good influence on others the more cheerful you are. You know what, there are times um, uh, we we try to, uh, my wife and I, it's not, it doesn't always happen. Um, Yeah, I don't think parents are always 100% cheerful around their children. Uh, But... uh, other than Bob, he's always been cheerful with his children, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think all, any parents in here can recognize, you know what, we're not always... Yeah, have moments. we all have our moments, that's for sure. Um, but what we try, to, at least the goal is, to have a cheerful home. And you know what, we, you know what my wife and I found? We want to have cheerful children. You know what we found goes the farthest with having cheerful children? Is if we have the right attitude ourselves. And uh, if we don't have the right attitude, it starts to show up. If we have the right attitude, it, 
you know, eventually starts to show up in the right way. And, um, but the, the, uh, it, it's, important just to, it's important to have a merry heart. Once again, it's not wrong to, to experience grief and affliction and those things, but it's where we live. What is, our, how, how, what is the state of our heart on an ongoing basis? And um, things can be tough financially. Things can be tough in other ways, whether it's health-wise. But there's still, there can still be something to rejoice about. It can, you can still have that disposition of the heart that I still have a merry heart even in the midst of these trials and challenges and, and, and allow God to work and wait, wait on the Lord uh, to see what He does through these trials and challenges. So we're going to stop right there with verse 15. Uh, next week we'll focus on one verse, one subject of the scorner. And it'll be verse 12, a scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. That'll be the basis, the foundation for these, uh, for next week uh, with the scorner. It's a very important subject of, of the scorner, knowing who the scorner is, and then dealing with the scorner. And also, uh, us not getting the attitude of a scorner ourselves. That's a, being a scorner is one of the worst things for a person to be. It's a bad state. Once a person gets to a scorner, uh, to be a scorner, it's a really serious situation. We'll see those verses about the scorner uh, next week, Lord willing.